What are you brewing, Lance? Pica Solidad. Pepe Hion! No, my god, you're going to turn into Pepe! Yeah, right. This was my special guest I was talking about. What's up everyone? Lance Hedrick here and today I have a very special video. We are going to start looking at the origin of coffee and today we're going to start that by speaking with the producer of Finca Solidad in Ecuador, Pepe Hijon. Now Pepe has produced some incredible coffees over the years and I found him back in 2021 with his beautiful Tipica Mejorada Tea Oxidator. I found it from Manhattan Roasters in the Netherlands, and since then I've been hooked. We have some roasted by Say in New York, and some from Glyph in Singapore, and that's what we're sipping right now. I want to take an excursion into his experience and his thoughts on the current, the current model of coffee around the world, as well as what it's like for producers at the origin level. So we're gonna look back at terroir, we're gonna look at different things that affect producers and how we as people, as consumers, can actually affect any type of change. Cheers, Pepe. Cheers, Lance. Thanks for coming to Portugal. Oh, man, I'm so happy to be here. Tell us about your farm in Ecuador. So the farm is located um, in North Ecuador, mm -hmm. in the Imbabura province, 1500 meters. Uh, it's in the Choco Andino area, which is um, a geopark, uh, one of the first geoparks in South America. It's wild everywhere. We mm -hmm. don't have a cell phone signal, so wow. I'm pretty much lost there. Soledad, the name came with the farm, but it went out nice because I was a solo climber before I, I was a coffee guy. I climbed um, the highest mountain of every continental peak wow. solo, and that's how it just happened, you know. And bought the farm in 2010. Uh, it took uh, almost uh, a decade to get things running, but now I'm very happy because uh, things are happening and I'm, I'm creating a a very nice terroir and some very nice coffees to share with people. So you got your farm, what, 14 years ago or so? Yes. And you said in the last few years, years it really started to take off? Yeah, it took a long time to really understand the terroir and especially to get uh, to the end consumer, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, coffee producers are sometimes in the bottom of the coffee chain and uh, we're not really uh, cared for. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very frustrating at the beginning. I almost, I almost turned down into another, another, another job. Oh, wow. But I love coffee and I fell in love for, with it. Remember, we were talking about coffee when I was a mountain climber. I had never had a cup of coffee because I thought Nescafe was everything and I hated it. <laughs> so uh, now after planting and, and seeing how it evolves with the terroir, with the people, with nature, it's just all I talk about, man. Oh, yeah. My oh, wife yeah. doesn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> So for people who are uh, new to coffee or are beginner home enthusiasts or just don't know much about how coffee is grown, can you just walk us through the steps from how long it takes to like, what planting a seed looks Perfect. like, how long it takes, et cetera, processing and all that. Perfect. Uh, coffee is an amazing product from nature. I think it's more than a drug, it's a medicine, but it takes a long time for mm -hmm. it to happen. You have to curate it. You have to treat it almost like a child. Uh, since you have the seed and, you, and you, you plant it, you need to wait for almost one year for it to be able to go to the field, to the ground, mm. and you plant it again for its life. Mm. And then you have to wait about three, four years until you have the first few coffee cherries, which mm. is a long time at the yeah. end. And then the, the peak harvest and the really good quality happens at the seventh year. And that's when we take into consideration having healthy soils. Yeah. Because like most of the soils in our planet are, I'm, I'm sorry, depleted because we've treated them very badly, we mm -hmm. burned, you know, chemicals and stuff. So if you really have want to have a healthy soil and add that to the equation, you need 15 years because mm -hmm. you need to plant trees, then cut the trees, and then you have the biomass that, to, to have healthy coffee. So it's a, it's a lifetime experience, man. When you have the coffee cherries, which are fruits, by the way, people don't understand that coffee is a fruit, mm -hmm. um, you have to go through an immersive process where you try to understand what's the best way to make that coffee shine. Because as I say, coffee comes out from the tree as a 90 plus coffee. What, what I mean by 90 plus coffee, it's a very, very nice, defined, elegant mm -hmm. piece of fruit. It's up to us humans to try to express the language of the terroir mm -hmm. and make it shine, you know? So you can either go the natural process, honey process, wash process, but uh, at the end, what you really want to is that, that embryo, in my opinion, um, coffee is alive. And when you go through the stages of processing and drying, you have to give that coffee uh, good energies, passion, you have to transmit that to it so it will go down to the stage of being uh, very wet to 11% humidity in a happy way. So yeah. it may sound funny, but to me that has a lot of sense. In my years traveling, uh, I've visited many, many farms and um, I've realized that coffee has a sense that it listens to your dreams. Like uh, if, if you want to create this kind, this kind of, 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 
of a profiling coffee and you do a really good job, the coffee will somehow listen to your dream and make it happen. Mm -hmm. It could sound weird, Lance, but I'm a weird guy. <laughs> so I believe I was a psychologist. I studied psychology. And as much as I don't understand humans, I think I'm starting to understand coffee. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> So it takes roughly from the beginning of mm -hmm. planting to actually harvesting four to five years. Absolutely. And so during that time, how do producers make money? Ah, th that's a good question. We just don't. We just uh, trust fate. It's a, it's, a, it's a work of love. You know, it's like uh, trusting in something and then thinking of something higher. I think coffee producers, I'm, and I think I'm talking for most of them, are not here for the money. If you mm -hmm. wanted money, you would go into stock, you would go into you know real estate, whatever. Sure. But the coffee people are there because they have a passion for nature. They have a passion to, to recreate something beautiful, to be able to share that experience with other responsible consumers mm -hmm. and make the world a better place. That, Absolutely. That, that, that's like the dream that, that, that we have all together. That's if beautiful. it was about money, guys, there wouldn't be any coffee. <laughs> well, coffee's always been bound to, to humanity ever since long, long time ago in Ethiopia and Sudan. And, it, and, and then in, as, as, it, as it evolved, it started to be bound with, with colonialism. You know, mm -hmm. you, you have these big coffee plantations and you would have these poor people working there and, and it would be just about unsustainable. And you have like uh, very low prices and uh, these countries will not grow by growing coffee. They mm. will just stay poor. Yeah. That's how coffee went through Africa, Central America, etc., etc., and that's what created the commodity, the commodity coffee price. That you know, the guys in New York, New York, that don't even drink good coffee unless it's Lance's coffee, <laughs> <laughs> don't know about. So, wh what is commodity coffee? Is is coffee that's traded without a soul, without thinking of where it comes from, mm -hmm. what's the price for the planet, what's the price for the people, and um, as we were talking on the airplane. Uh, when you go to a supermarket and say you want to buy good coffee and you want to be a part of the planet and leave a good footprint, whatever, and you go for the organic coffee and you pay $2 extra, the reality is that you're doing nothing because you're doing nothing to the industry, you're doing nothing to the producer, you're just paying a middleman some, some extra money so he can have a seal or a certification, but that money doesn't go to the producer. And I'm talking from the producer standpoint because mm -hmm. I am a producer and at, at our co-op in Intag in Ecuador, we have to pay the certification for like $12,000, $15,000 a year to be able to, to have the organic seal or something like that. And that's bollocks, man. That's outrageous. They should pay us to be organic. They mm -hmm. should pay us to, to do the, the, the good practices to keep the planet. But it's the opposite way. Yeah. So there's much more to do in that sense. And when you do that and you think you're doing something from the planet, you are not. You have to get more committed into coffee. What is an actionable step they can take as opposed to just going and buying, you know, the typical commodity? How can they see and know a coffee is, you know, b bought with wages that are fair? And well, you know, at the be we're not we're not to fair yet, but at least you know, yeah. a stepping stone know. towards fair. What what are some tips that you know from a producer's point of view? Ah, that's a really good question and it has many, many ways to answer it. Of course. Uh, I think the most important one, at least for me, is becoming more sensitive, you mm -hmm. know, more responsible. And how do you become more sensitive? By just trying coffee, but trying coffee in a, in, a, in a specialty way, you know, like not with sugar and creamers and addings and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. just trying to understand what coffee means. Yeah. If you get the perception that coffee is more than just caffeine, then it's more than just a hot beverage, and you try to immerse yourself into the sensory experience, and it becomes part of your daily ritual, then people are, start, is gonna, are gonna start to, to realize the differences that uh, not just because a bag is pretty, it means it has good coffee, and not just because a bag is small, it's expensive coffee. Yeah. You need to find that balance. And the, unfortunately, the responsibility is up to you guys. It's not up to us. It's true. We are doing this, uh, I think we are trying to communicate, we are trying to be a bridge into this sensory awakening, into this more sustainable world, but it, it requires a little more from the end consumer. It's of course. It's not just about paying two extra dollars for that pound in the supermarket. It's doing research. It's, it's about doing research and it's about immersing yourself, mm -hmm. going back into your na natural habits, like your animal habits, like when, when we were like 3,000 years ago, more into instinct, more into feeling stuff and less into watching stuff, you know? Yeah. Everything is about TV now, colors, these, these, I wanna buy, I wanna buy. That's not the way. Coffee tries to awaken you into more inner spirits. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on the current, even though it's been kind of waning over the past couple of years, but the current kind of trend of roasters and importers being transparent with their prices, do you see that as good, bad, beautiful. whatever? Okay. Yeah, I think it's beautiful. I think it's the, the more you connect and the less you, you cut down the middleman, the, the more you cut down the middleman, that's the way. And 
it, you know, when COVID happened, it was one of the worst tragedies in our, in, in our planet, but it was also a, a point of start where everybody was at the same level. Yeah. We, were, we were all like closed down in our houses. We could not move, we could not work, we could not do that. But that opened a few doors, you know, social media became more of a vessel mm -hmm. for people to communicate. Coffee shops were closed. Shit, I can't get my coffee. So yeah. what do I do? I brew my coffee. How do I do my coffee? What is water? What is grind size? What is method? <laughs> what is this? So it was good. Yeah. So I think the level of quality in, in consumption just skyrocketed with COVID, yeah. which was one of the good things that started connecting more people towards origin, flavor, and, and, and not just going to a coffee shop, standing in the line, paying five bucks, and then going. Yeah. It's more than that, guys. We need more commitment from everybody. One of my main goals in life is not about making Finca Soledad or not even Pepe famous. What I want to do is empower more producers from Ecuador mm -hmm. to be able to, to get more money for, for, what they, for, for their work. We were talking about, about this in, uh, a while ago, but wages in Ecuador are like super high, Lance. Oh yeah. We pay about 25 to $30 a day for a worker, which you may consider little, you know, in, in industrial countries, but I'll give an example. In Colombia, it's $10. Mm -hmm. In Central America, it's five dollars, and guess how much people get paid in Africa? How much? Fifty cents to a dollar for a day of work. <sighs> that's why that coffee is cheap. That's why commodity coffee is cheap. That's why you buy the, the cheap bag and blah, blah blah blah. So that's not the answer, man. Yeah. The answer is being fair from the beginning to the start. So I'm actually very happy when I pay higher wages because I think most of the money that people pay for Ecuadorian coffee that's expensive does go back not just to the producer but but by the hands that help. Us get there. You see this uh, fetishization of producers and how, oh, these poor farmers, they need our help, and they always put the face of the farm as the one that we need to kind of help. But it, that, that takes away and detracts from the fact that it's not a, a single person situation. Absolutely. How many, how many people, so you, your, your farm is how big? Uh, the farm is 120 hectares, but it's mostly forest. Okay. The coffee plantation is only five. So for five okay. hectares, which is relatively small, yeah. uh, how many workers does it take for a harvest? Uh, for a harvest, it's about uh, 15, 20 workers, mm -hmm. which is a lot if you start making up and adding, adding up the money. Yeah. And at the beginning, when I was a coffee farmer, that was a pain in the ass to me, man, because I had, at the end of the week, come up with like three, four thousand dollars cash yeah. to pay the workers. Yeah. But then I'll bring the coffee to the middleman, the, the importer, the exporter, whatever, and he'd pay me like six, seven months later, and I would get paid, say, five dollars a pound, and making the coffee would cost me like eight, nine dollars a pound. So I was always losing money. So what's, that's very bad for the producer, that's very bad for me towards the worker, I'm always pushing them yeah, to do yeah. more, to harvest more. But now that I'm getting paid a fair price, to me it's a joy to bring yeah. the people in, man. It's a joy to pay my workers, my girls, the people that come and help out at the farm. Yeah. And if they harvest 50 kilos in one day, or if they harvest 30, I don't care, man. Yeah. I'm just happy because I know I'm gonna turn those coffee beans into something beautiful, and I'm gonna get paid for it. Put this all in perspective. Right now in the commodity market, coffee's just over a dollar a pound. It's like a dollar forty, a dollar fifty, dollar sixty. brother. It's Rat somewhere race. around there. And what he is saying is, for a lot of his coffees, based off the wages he's paying and everything else, it takes seven, eight dollars a pound just to get cost. it ready. Just cost. And he was getting paid only five dollars a pound. That's still at five dollars a pound. That is still five times commodity price. So when you're buying commodity coffee. He absolutely wouldn't be able to run his farm. So this is in a previous video I discussed paying more for coffee, making sure we're seeking out coffees where maybe we know how much money's going back to the farm. Now it's not a perfect it's not a perfect thing, obviously. Mm -hmm. Even if we know how much money's going to a farm, we don't know how much is going to the pickers, to the sorters, to the people processing. But it's you know it's. That's a, that's a, a next step. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Some people think that uh, when you're buying expensive coffee, you're a snob, but that's not right, man. That's not right. A lot of people do that because they're snobby, maybe, but the vast majority of us freaks, uh, geeks or whatever we can call ourselves, coffee lovers, like sensory pirates, yeah. we just do this because we love it, because yeah. we love the sensation, but we also love that the people in the back of the chain, it's not about, it's not the right word chain, but in yeah. the back of, all the way back to the farm are paid well, man. Yeah. So when you drink this cup of coffee, you get a really nice uh, sensory experience, but you also cleanse your soul because you are really doing something for the planet. Absolutely. In this case, you are really, I can tell you because I'm a producer. Yeah. I can tell you that when I'm getting well paid, that money is shared, man, mm -hmm. all the way around through my people. Yeah. And it makes the planet better because I'm planting trees. I don't care if I have like, uh, a uh, hundred bags of coffee uh, per hectare yield. I don't care about that, man. Yeah. I, I care about the ecosystem, yeah. the plants, the trees. So 
Uh, I've learned that in, in, in places like in Panama, like Joseph Brodsky, you know, he has this farm where he has like these old trees and a few coffee plants. And I'm like, dude, but you're not going to get any coffee. And he's like, I don't care. Yeah. I'm not here for the amount of coffee. I'm here for the quality of living, the sustainability. And that's what we should aim as, as, as a community. Yeah. So it's beautiful. It's empowering the producer. We yeah. just were a big coffee fair. And there were a lot of producers yeah. from all around the world. We have people from Peru, from Salvador, yeah. from Colombia, from Panama, and we were all leveled on the same ground. Yeah. That's what I like about the coffee events. You know, it's all about the champion and who wins and who, who doesn't. But at the end, it's only one person that wins, you know. Mm. But the rest, the rest, they just win by sharing, by enjoying, by Community. leveling the ground. Absolutely. Creating communities, sharing, giving hugs. Yeah. That to me is the most important part of, of the specialty coffee shows. Commodity coffee is like, it's like a rat race. But if you win the rat, the, the rat race, you're still a rat. <laughs> oh, wow, that's I mean, that's rough. I but mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to move from that. We have to move to another standard, to a more human, a more equal, a more sustainable path. Yeah. And that's why I love specialty coffee, man. It's not just because of the taste. It is because of the taste. But it's not <laughs> just because of it. It's because we are trying to create. Even we may sound romantic, mm -hmm. but we are trying to create a better society. Yeah. A society of more inclusion. What's beautiful about coffee? When I think about my farm and the people, um, to plant coffee, you need an ecosystem. Right? Mm -hmm. It's just not about ravaging trees and destroying stuff. That's not uh, specialty coffee. That's commodity coffee. Sure. So you need an ecosystem. So you see the birds coming back. You see the butterflies, the insects, the snakes. Yeah. So you are good to the planet. You create trees. You create ecosystem. You, you, you stop erosion, etc., etc. Second step, you pay high wages, mm -hmm. you know, you pay people lots of money to come to your farm and harvest your coffee. And the beauty of it among that is that it's mainly women. Women in the rural societies are laid, they, they stay in the house, they cook, they don't have any power, they don't have any money. And in coffee, it's the opposite. We need more women working because they are more vibrant, you know, they are more subtle when they harvest the coffee. It's like not like us men that want to break things. Yeah, and yeah, like, yeah. Ah. So you, you provide money to... Um, a, a part of the society that's in is in the in not so well, you know. Mm -hmm. In rural societies, women are not well treated. Yeah. So that's the second thing, and the third thing is that coffee, dude. You can't you can't go to work without coffee. So it's good for the society. Yeah. So if you think about coffee, it's an all around beautiful thing. Just we need to pay more attention to the subtleties and the differences and the nuances, as you say. Uh, you can pay. $20 for a one kilo bag of shit, or you can pay $20 for a really small bag of love. Before I went to the world of coffee, um, I did a little travel with my family, with mm -hmm. my mother, Brazilian, and my sister, Tatiana, who lives in the Galapagos. So we landed in Holland, so we went to Amsterdam. And you walk down the street and you see cafe, 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 yep. cafe, cafe. And what do you see, man? People drinking beer, smoking pot, but there's no coffee. There's no good coffee. But they use the word coffee, you know? Mm. Then I went to Morocco, and in Morocco, you see cafe, 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 cafe everywhere, but they drink really shit coffee. Then I went to Israel, Jordan, and you see the, the, the use of the word coffee. I think they use word coffee more than the word sex or sugar or water. Yeah. It's always prostituted in a way. Yeah, yeah. We have to give that sense back, the sense of coffee being a medicine, something of a ritual, the law habitual, that yeah. you do every day. So I think we have a, a, a responsibility and also an opportunity. Yeah. People that talk about coffee and complain, that's not good, man. Oh, I need more coffee because my company is growing. That's not the issue. It's not about more. Mm. It's about quality and sustainability. Yeah. That's where we need to aim as, a, as an industry. Yeah, in Ecuador, we're very lucky to start working the two very special varieties. Yeah. Uh, everything comes from Africa, of course, mm -hmm. but this one we're taking, we're brought to Ecuador 20 years ago, and they've started to adapt and really show like some amazing results. Uh, uh, Tipica Mejorado, okay. the coffee we're just trying right now. So it's Mejorado, I mean. It's Mejorado. Um, actually, the name was given not very scientifically, because the coffee is not, not a Tipica either. Okay. Like, you know, the bourbon Tipica division. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's an Ethiopian hail room. People yeah. talk about this uh, hybridation about bourbon and Tipica made the, made the Sidra, Sidra bourbon. That's crap. Okay. That, that's just changing names and, and playing with, with, with ignorance, I think. The reality is that all coffee comes from Ethiopia, and those came from Ethiopia. Uh, Tipica is an Ethiopian hail rum, which is a wild for, yeah. forest coffee. And Sidra was, is known for being an Ethiopian land race. Land race, I, I checked on the books, and it's when, when a coffee comes from Ethiopia, goes to a farm, and from the farm, it's been manipulated by men and then goes somewhere else. So okay. land race is less, let's say, 
pure origin. Okay. It yeah. has evolved a little bit. So he came to Ecuador 20 years ago through a company that was trying to uh, create uh, F1s, uh, hybrids and stuff with very good yield and but also very good quality. And uh, the person that was working there was, I don't know, wise enough or whatever, but he took some of those seeds to his farm and uh, when they were still kind of wild and grew those plants and they became something very beautiful, which pretty much started a new wave of coffee in Ecuador because we were all trying to imitate, you know, Colombia yeah. or Brazil or Peru, trying to bring hybrids that would never work in our country because okay. we are a very small country, man. We're yeah. the size of a football compared, <laughs> compared to Brazil. So it would not work to have, you know, Obataz, Novo Mundos yeah. or Caturras or Castillos, which I made the mistake of also planting. <laughs> um, so we went deep in into these uh, pure varietals and uh, Whoa, amazing. A, a lot of people, a lot of competitors are, are using it on the world stage. It's not like the Panamanian geisha, but the reason why is because Panama geisha has a long, longer history in Panama. Mm. So it has evolved and it has so well been cared of by these amazing producers that we have in Panama. And improvements in, in how yes. to take care of it. Yes, improvement how to take care of it and allowing the plant to be pampered, man. Mm -hmm. What happens when your wife treats you well, man? You're happy. So that, that, that's how it works. You treat plants well and in 10 years, you will see results. It's For not sure. tomorrow. So Cedra and Tipica are just getting getting on the world stage right now. And uh, a lot of more people are planting them in Ecuador, which is really good. And so those are the only things you grow on your farm? I have that. I have some uh, some geisha from Ethiopia and I have some geisha from Panama because uh, I must say, you know, I fell in love with coffee when I started trying these absolutely amazing geisha coffees from Panama. Yeah. Uh, the florals. I'm not a, I'm not a coffee guy. I told you at the beginning, mm -hmm. I didn't drink coffee when I was younger yeah. because I thought instant was everything and instant <laughs> sucked. So I was a tea guy. But when I started trying these geisha from Panama and the florals and the sweetness, I just like, oh, dude, this is what I have to do in life. Yeah. So little by little, I've been transforming the farm, taking away a few varietals that were not... Like a Tora Castillo. Were, yes, yeah. were not meant to be there. And um, it is harder to grow uh, pure varietals like Tipica Mejorada or, or Sidra. It is harder because they get sick and, you know, the yields are lower. But at the end, if you get paid right, you can do your job. Yeah. You can do your job. And that's what we're talking about here, about being able to make it sustainable. Yeah. Farmers need to pay their, their workers and need to pay also for tires, taxes, family, school, and everything. We're just like you. Yeah. So we need to make a little bit of money, and, and it's happening. Yeah. And that's thanks to the industry. What is your approach to processing when it comes to flavor in the cup, the labor-intensive aspect of it, the, the testing of it, and the failures? And then the second part of the question is, what is your view from your connections with other producers, your, your experience as a producer, what is your opinion of this new trend with not just infused coffees, but heavily, heavily processed coffees? So I want to hear both, uh, you know, your trials and errors, your approach, as well as your opinion on the current boom of alternative infused types of coffees. Oh, man, I just want to say that I'm enjoying this cup first. Dude, man. This Thanks again for coming. Oh, so amazing, man. It's lovely having you. What I look in a cup of coffee, elegance, balance, you know, transparency. What do I don't look in a cup of coffee? Intensity, excessiveness, or unbalance. Mm -hmm. And my approach to coffee is try, as I said before, to express the language of nature. Yeah. To express that bean that when you harvest it is a 90 plus bean, and then you start making errors and turning into an 82 and 83 and stuff like that. So yeah. in that sense, uh, Ed Visters, a famous climber from the States who was the first to summit the 14, 8000s and the seven summits, he wrote a book. And I always remember the name of the book, No Shortcuts to the Summit. Yeah. You can break it. You, you, you can be a, a good pro processor, a good producer, if you start playing with variables that are unnatural, yeah. that are artificial. Even if the taste profile is kind of good and is good for competition, I still consider that a shortcut. Yeah. I still consider that maybe not, not coffee, maybe, maybe something like a, uh, it's, it's a tough world. Uh, I know producers need to make their money yeah. and they get paid more when they do that. But it's not their responsibility. I think it's more like the roaster or the barista and the community itself that needs to go and understand that at the end of the day, what's more important is for you to be honest and also for you to be like, when you think about something to drink, Lance, mm -hmm. like, out of the world, not just coffee. Yeah. What's the thing that people drink most? It's water, mm -hmm. because water is simple, yeah. you know? It's not Coca-Cola. You can drink Coca-Cola for, for, for some time, but you get tired of it, man. Of course. You definitely get tired of it. So in the coffee world, we, we have this movement of people that are highly infusing, transforming coffee into something that it's not. But now it's, it's, it's legally done in, for competition, which I think is good. You know, it's clear for everybody to be able to do whatever they want. But I think at the end, we're gonna slowly, slowly, slowly come back into natural. 
Okay. Processing coffee, like making Tioxy, making Cedra Wave, it's really hard, Lance. Yeah. It takes a long time, many years. You know, you go into the dark rooms and you start playing with, with the coffee and taking care, pampering it. And it takes months of work to make something that might be good. Yeah. Might be very good or might be mm, not so good. But when you infuse coffees, you don't have to go through that. You just grab the coffee, however it is, you don't even take care of it. You just put something in it, close the box, open up, it smells like Pandora. And who cares, man? I'm getting yeah. paid a little more. Wave to me is not a process. People ask about what's a process and it's more a philosophy than a process. Okay. Why is that? Because it's not like two days of this, three days of that, seven days of that. Uh, in the wave processing, we treat the plant and the, and, the, and the fruit as a living organism. So that's the start of wave. Um, we don't uh, put the coffee in water to, to get the cherries clean because I think that that's uh, something invasive to the coffee because you add in a water that might be even dirty. So we want all the yeasts and all the natural bacteria, all that's living in that coffee, pl coffee plot, coffee piece, to go into the fermentation tank. Mm -hmm. So I've learned that uh, by walking around the world and I've seen that it works. And sometimes a little more uh, hard to control because yep. you don't have the exact variables, you don't have the exact amount of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But you have your terroir and you have to trust in your terroir. Yeah. So you put that in a tank and, and you ferment that for two, three, four, five, six days. It depends on the weather, the internal, external temperatures. So we try to measure that and see how long. And we are very, very based in smell, man. Yeah. Smell and, and touch. Like we open the tank, how it smell? Banana. Uh, we try a little cherry, how it smell? Like, uh, Cherries. Um, so we, we, we try to modulate and understand that. And when it has this perfect smell that we really like and we've really seen it works, we go through the next stage, which a lot of people don't talk about because people talk just about processing. Of course. How many hours anaerobic fermentation? How many hours in the tank? Blah, 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 blah. And to me, that's just part of, of something much bigger. Yeah. And drying. Lance. Yeah. Man, drying is like the most sexy thing in life. Especially if you do it in a dark room. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> no, for real, dude. In a dark room, you control the variables. Yeah. The sun is beautiful. The sun brings life to us, but it also drains. Mm -hmm. You sweat when you're in the sun. You, you dry, you know, if you're in a desert, whatever. So it happens the same with the cherries, washed or natural. When you put them in the sun, you start dehydrating them, yes. You start drying stuff, but you also apply in a lot of UV rays yeah. that burn and in a way and take all those funky, crazy, beautiful volatiles in yeah. coffee. So I've st I'm starting to understand a little more about that. And in the dark room, you can recreate a, a, a system where you not only apply um, temperature and dehumidifying uh, ambient, but you also uh, make it in a way that it's very stable. Yeah. It's not that oh, it's true. hot at night, it's yeah, cold in the yeah. morning, hot at night. So that creates stress in the embryo. You just yeah. do it very slowly, kill it softly, 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 softly. So the embryo understands, because it's alive, that it has to go into a dormant state. Yeah. It's not. Do you have to reproduce? No. Do you have to die? No. Do you have to reproduce? No. It's just like a dormant state. So it's like almost going into like... So it's drying it softly. Drying it softly. Drying it softly. Drying it softly. <laughs> dehydrating it softly and keeping all the, the, the beauty of it inside. The oxidator is a different process. There we pick the cherries. Of course, we don't touch the, the, the terroir. But instead of fermenting, which is uh, uh, without, the, 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 without oxygen, we put oxygen there, so we oxidize the coffee. Yeah. We leave it in an open tank for two nights and it starts uh, almost, rotting is not the word, but it, it starts uh, um, transforming faster. Mm -hmm. After that, we deep pulp dry. Deep pulper is a machine that takes the skin out, but it keeps the mucilage. Mm -hmm. And then we put it on grain pro bags for two days. Then we that's fermentation. And the, the mucilage kind of naturally falls off the, the, um, the, the seed. And then we do a quick wash and then we start doing the drying. Nice. That's the idea. So it's a clean coffee, as you see, it's very vibrant. Yeah. It's, it's very terroir driven. And it's already gone. <laughs> it, it's something that I really enjoy. It's a dev everyday coffee. Yes. More funky coffees, like let's say more fermented coffees, more treated coffees are good for maybe once a week or, or so like that, but this is like a daily, oh, a yeah. daily routine, baby. I want to thank you again for coming and representing Ecuador, representing Ecuador. Fica Solidad. Um, really, really appreciate it. And I know everybody watching this is going to really appreciate it. So, I mean, you just dropped knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb. If you want to check out the stuff that he's doing, what's your Instagram handle? Oh, it's Finca Soledad Intag uh, okay. in Instinto Coffee, because I've also started roasting. Uh, to know your coffee, you have to know, you know everything about the coffee. You have to be able to cup it, you have to be able to roast it. So it's been very interesting to have a lab in situ. Yeah. I get students from the world to come and, and, and I can share the experience properly. I have the right tools, you know, I have a beautiful grinder. I'm going to get a beautiful espresso machine because I, I need, I think we need to level it up. You know, we have yeah. the right tools. 
for the right work and for the right coffee. Follow along because he posts the roasters that get his coffee and grab some of that coffee and uh, check out other. What are some other great farms in Ecuador that you want to shout out? Wow, there are so many. You know, we're just getting started. We have uh, Hacienda Santa Gertrudis, which is in Loja, which has Juan Peña from La Papaya, yeah. who, who's very well known. And we have these little farmers that are going to start doing a good job. And it's just a rising tide, man. Yeah. I think it's everybody's getting this vibe, is getting this, this energy. And it's, it's so nice, Lance, that you invited me because I feel that I can I reach a broader audience. Yeah. Not just reaching like the coffee crazy people that, that we live in that world, but just broader audience. And that's what we want, man. Make the world a better place. Life is beautiful. Life is Let's beautiful. make it beautiful through coffee. Absolutely. Yeah. That is a fantastic way to end it. Well, if you all liked all this, you know, hit the like and subscribe. Go give him a follow because that is an important thing. Watch his crazy antics. We, uh, we have some fun on Instagram together through the <laughs> stories. But, um, yeah, thank you all for watching. I hope that you brew something tasty today as we have brewed a few cups. Um, and, yeah, I think that's about it. We walk the talk, brother. Well, that's right. That's right. All right. We walk the talk. Well, if there's one last thing you want to say. I love you guys. Te amo.